Welcome to the Political Trenches, local government at work, the show that delves into the municipal stories that are making the headlines from across Canada. Today, we're heading to Wild Rose Country, also called the province of Alberta. But before that, we will have some big stories to dive into. So jump in your chuck wagon as we are heading west. Ian, it seems that every day there has been something going on across Canada municipally. For me, at least, it was hard to narrow down the top three stories for this episode. It truly seems that municipal news never stops, does it? It never does. I, I'm not sure what to do with your chuck wagon comment. Anyway, no, you're right. It doesn't. And it, that's kind of good, too. It means that there's some activity going on. It also means it's kind of the real bedrock or grassroots of, of local of government in this country. And it, the good, the bad, and the ugly all the time. So we'll dive into the top three stories. And first, we'll go over to our neighboring province of Saskatchewan, where the Saskatchewan Provincial Privacy Commissioner has formally advised that the Saskatchewan Ministry of Government Relations, who looks after municipal affairs, should be publishing the financial documents it receives annually from municipal counterparts for public access. Asked to review a $11,000 fee estimate for a freedom of information request from the Canadian Taxpayer Federation, Saskatchewan's Information and Privacy Commissioner, Commissioner concluded in his recommendations that the ministry should lower its fee but also be posting such records online openly. Offering a larger recommendation, the Privacy Commissioner also said the question would be best absolved by the province, quote, making financial statements and auditors reports it receives from municipalities available to the public, end quote. Saskatchewan did maintain an online database for municipalities' financial records in the early 2000s, though it has not been updated since 2008. Ian, I was conflicted about how I should ask the first question here. All right. Is it is it the responsibility of the province to be open and transparent on the financial records, or is it to the municipality's responsibility to be open and transparent with their audits and their financial statements to the general public? Sure. Well, I mean, fundamentally and philosophical, municipalities exist because a group of people chose to live in a particular area. They in turn hired a board of directors to look after the place twenty four seven because they didn't want to. So. Ultimately, the local government is responsive to the people, and it's only there because there happen to be people there. Based on that comment, I'm a little surprised that this information is not publicly available already. The, this would be something, it's my money that I pay to my municipality, whether it's a tax or whether it's a user fee or something for a permit or whatever the case may be. And so those are the dollars that my neighbors and I contribute. I'm a little surprised if the audited financial statements aren't publicly available. You're right, it is transparency. Uh, it could well be that this is the like the the um, co coalescence of of information, if you like, from the hundreds of municipalities in Saskatchewan, uh, very small to very large, uh, to put all the information in one place. Another interesting thing to me was that this is being led or driven or at least have an impact via the Canadian Taxpayers Federation or CTF, which is all about dollars and cents. It's not, I mean, there's nothing social particularly about it. So to me, anyway, that those were the interesting things. A, that it wasn't being done before. B, that it was public dollars anyway. And C, that this was coming from the Taxpayers Federation. Are other provincial jurisdictions already doing similar things like this, like already being open and transparent with the financial records that municipalities do give to the provinces? Or is this uh, not a unique situation that Saskatchewan finds itself in? Well, maybe I'm misunderstanding it a little bit, but my take is that things like budgets, municipal budgets, or the back end of it, municipal audits, ought to be public documents. And so they are things that every municipality, every incorporated municipality in this country is probably already required to do. And most, if not all of them, would be posting those on their websites anyway. So it is something that is required in other provinces. I don't know if it's every other province, and it surprises me a little bit that this public posting isn't required in Saskatchewan. Again, maybe I'm reading it wrong somehow. So I've never... I. I... I've seen audits being done in municipalities working for a municipality in Northern Alberta, but I've never been on the end of actually being in a meeting during an audit process. 
what what do auditors look at when they are looking through the financial records of a municipality? Because we, we here in Alberta, uh, we're seeing that uh, go through in El- in Chestermere, where uh, yeah. provincial uh, mandate asked for an actual financial audit uh, of the municipal records, and it did find there was some disparities, uh, and they're going through that. But what exactly are auditors looking for, and what is the problem? This is sort of mandate in this general sense to look at what is going on in the uh, municipal realm. Is it just literally, are you spending your dollars correctly and you're balancing your budget every year? Or is there more in depth that they're looking at? Simplistically, yeah, that's what it is. Uh, You've got, you've (laughs) set a budget. Have you spent the money is to check on the back end of it. Have you spent the money with the way you thought you were going or the way you said you were going to spend the money? If not, why not? Are there specific pieces within that we might want to have a look at? And then sometimes there are audits around process as well. Are you being efficient in the way that you do things? Uh, what you mentioned uh, Chestermere. My my expectation on Chestermere is a uh, city in Alberta that's undergone some significant disruption the last few years. What's happened most recently would be an audit firm has come in and done a forensic audit, just to, again, check up on the audit itself and find out if what the auditors were reporting was like true and real based on the information they were given by the municipality. Something unique, maybe not quite unique, but certainly rare about the role of the auditor versus all the other service providers in the municipality is the auditor is, the outside auditor is usually hired by council rather than by administration or the the municipality itself. And as such, the auditor is responsive to council. And that means the council can provide direction to the auditor, can receive input directly from the auditor without any members of administration being present. So it it remove it moves the administrative side of the local government away from the political or legislative side of the local government. I'm an advocate for the auditor always meeting with council in camera every year, uh, regardless of whether there's a problem or not, so that council can ask questions of the auditor um, that they may not want to ask if members or management are present. And in turn, the auditor can say things to council uh, that maybe they wouldn't want to say with members of management present either. And if it's a regular and routine occurrence every year, there are no immediate red flags raised when council wants to speak to the auditor. So to me, it's looking at the back end of the budget. And that's council, That's one, one of the things that council needs to be checking up on. So speaking of problem children in the municipal realm, let's head over to our second story. And we're heading over to the other side of our uh, province of Alberta to British Columbia, where known for its natural beauty, Harrison Hot Springs is a place for many to unwind in a spa in Harrison Lake or the surrounding mountains. But some residents say they're now considering leaving the picturesque village around 100 kilometers east of Vancouver because they're alarmed by the level of dysfunction from their elected officials. Since the fall 2022 municipal election, Harrison's mayor and four councillors have been at odds resulting in the chaotic council meetings, a backlog of village businesses and rancor from that has spread into the community. One village resident said, quote, a lot of us are actually looking to move somewhere else because we're horrified. That resident has lived in the community for 11 years with her husband. She went on to say, quote, this is husband against wife, neighbor against neighbor, friend against friend. It is crazy. The stress is unbelievable, end quote. The village's troubles seem to hit a new low on April 15th when Mayor Wood began a council meeting by saying, quote, today is a sad day for this village. In my opinion, there is a coup, end quote. Wood, who campaigned on cleaning house in the council, alleges that three councillors are have ganged up against him and Councillor Allen to prevent them from pushing ahead with any of their initiatives. He also alleges that the three opposition councillors are empowering the village's chief administrative officer, Tyson Koch, to organize council meetings, including the preparation of agendas rather than the mayor. Now, Ian, when is enough enough? I went back prior to this recording and we had talked about Harrison Hot Springs back in early 2023, but it seems like after a year, literally nothing has gotten better. When does the province need to step in? Well, the province has already stepped in. 
Harrison Hot Springs has been on our radar for a while and we've talked about it before. I have no idea who's right in this kid's situation, if anybody. What it appears to be on the surface, though, is a group of authority figures, counselors who are supposed to be leaders, putting themselves ahead of the people they're supposed to serve. And the infighting has meant that the actual work of, of discharging the responsibilities of a local government uh, is taking a backseat to some of the entertainment that is being provided from within council. So because there are multiple versions of the truth, it's he said, she said, he said, she said times whatever number of council members there happen to be, we don't really know where reality is, which is why the municipal advisor was asked to come in and provide some recommendations in the first place. To me, the maybe it's irony or sad irony or something, is that the current, current round of discord, a conflict, is about codes of conduct and things like CAO council co covenants, which you may have made reference to as well. I read a recent set of council minutes just to see just to see what's going on in this community and see what sort of things are happening as a matter of routine. They, council meetings, a lot of motions are passed unanimously, but a lot of them are just routine things. But when there is a motion that fails at council, they mention who votes against it. And I wonder if that means that is there always called for recorded votes or maybe there's something in their procedure bylaw that says they need a recorded vote. But this stops the any decision of council being a council decision because now we're giving people the three people or, or whomever vote against something uh, a leg to stand on to say that they go on the record as being opposed to something. In this case, there's just far too many trees for the forest to even be visible. There's a lot going on here. I'm shocked at the residents' perspective here because this is not the first municipality to go through some troubling challenges, and I don't, I, I, I speak uh, with some certainty that this will not be the last municipality that goes through some challenges. But do residents have the? I don't want to say they have the right because they do have the right to move on, but are they in the right to saying, you know what? This is not what we signed up for. When we moved here 11 years ago, we were expecting peace and tranquility. And what we've got is literally not peace and tranquility. We've got entertainment. That's got to be worth something. Local government, any form of government for that matter, is, I kind of think of it, if government is kind of like restaurant servers or referees. If they're doing their jobs, you barely notice the things they're doing. because Everything's going smoothly. But when they become the show, it's always a problem. And that's what's happened here. The the activist, it's like small a activist people you made reference to as part of your introduction are probably some of the, I think you said 1,500 people or so who live in town who are threatening to leave over this. I suspect a lot of that's hyperbole. And a lot of those people who have spoken up are on one side or another of this debate. But if I look through, I went and I actually went and looked through the municipal advisor's final report. One of the things that council was asked to do was adopt this report and the things that were the recommendations. And they were really contentious things like establishing a professional development budget or revising the procedure bylaw or finalizing their official community plan, which is like an official plan or a municipal, de municipal development plan, those sort of things. So basic, basic stuff about a group of people working together or about a municipality operating appropriately until they get these bedrock things out of the way and they begin to see each other as like their first team. They didn't, they didn't like elect each other, but they do have to now work with each other for the next two and a half years, unless something unto more untowards happens or somebody leaves. So there are all kinds of problems going on here and they need to get out of their own way and actually fall into the background like the good referee would do. So we're going to head to our final story of this show, and we're heading to Ontario, where Gravenhurst Mayor Heidi Lorenz expressed her frustration at council during a nearly hour-long discussion about in-person hybrid meetings for the municipality. Her comments regard an October 17, 2023 Committee of the Whole meeting, where a working session was held to review policy options for hybrid council meetings. The mayor has stated she did not attend that meeting. And that is important. Just remind that. A report from the town's director of legislative services clerk brought forth recommendations that from that 2023 meeting and was present pres, presented to council at its April 16th meeting. Some of the recommendations included while hybrid connections are available, the general expectation is councillors shall participate in meetings in person and electronic participation will be facilitated 
for unusual and exceptional circumstances only with a maximum number of three council meetings a councillor can virtually participate in a calendar year. Committee of the whole, planning council, and or special meeting of council, and three subcommittee meetings. Approval for the electronic participation is at the discretion of the mayor if a councillor wishes to participate electronically. For any reason, written notice is required to be submitted to the mayor and clerk by noon the day prior to the meeting. However, during the April 15th meeting, some councillors stated three virtual council meetings per year was not enough and the number should be possibly up to a, as many as six meetings per year. Ian, Hybrid meetings have been the rage since COVID-19. I hate using the COVID-19 excuse, but it's literally the reason why we have electronic virtual meetings now. They seem to be not going away. Is it not the responsibility of a councillor, of a mayor to be president at that council meetings? And this discussion is literally about is three enough or is six enough? It does seem or, to be like shuffling. <laughs> yeah, right? This is Three and six, to my take, are purely arbitrary. Maybe there's something behind them, but maybe not. Maybe they just got stuck on a number. But the philosophical point behind this is who has to physically show up? Are we okay with people virtual? Are we okay with a mix of this? There's a reference in the story, and you brought it up too, that this is probably precipitated through the pandemic when we did the best we could with the circumstances that we had as local governments across the country. And it, for the most part, worked. I don't think anybody disagrees that in-person meetings are a better way to go. We we I mean, obviously miss some of those visual cues. Uh, we miss some of those tone of voice pieces. We miss some of what's going on in, around the around the uh, the building or around the gallery. So all of those things are missing in the virtual meetings uh, that people would attend, whether it's hybrid or whether it's purely virtual. On the other side, I can understand that a, like a municipality where it can take hours of travel to get to the county office or the municipal district office, but in a in a city or a town where you're across across town, it's I mean it's it's a different story. I don't I don't buy a lot of this on virtual meetings. So and to me, we need to look at some of the barriers that need to be removed. What's in the way? Is it physical access? Is it needs of parenting that need to be looked after? Are we looking at things like abusive or uncivil situations? And really, the hybrid or virtual doesn't fix those. It puts a bit of a band aid over them. So I, I don't think that virtual meetings are a great idea. I see why they're there. And it's also a way for, for council to not have to deal with an angry gallery sometimes, which may be good or maybe bad, but you also don't get the feeling for the people who are in the room either. So that said, I do see more and more places going virtual or going hybrid uh, once that was became allowed by changes to provincial and territorial acts, again, in reference to times after the pandemic and it's coming in this case i don't think the i don't think it's the right way to go at this time and the number to your case is arbitrary i couldn't agree more but we'll be right back with the president of the rural municipalities of alberta reeve paul mclaughlin Welcome to the Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. Our guest today is Reeve Paul McLaughlin, President of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta. The province of Alberta has been looking at changing how municipalities operate, run in elections, work under emergencies, and are funded with a trifecta of bills that have been released in the last month and a half. Bill 18, defending Alberta's provincial priorities, would require the federal government to work with the province to fund any municipal issues. Bill 20, the Municipal Statutes Amendment Act of 2024, would allow the province to amend or repeal any bylaw that the municipality passes if the province's, province deems it not in the province's interest. It would also introduce political parties at the municipal level at two cities before expanding it to potentially all municipalities in the next, next election. And finally, just last week, Bill 21, the Emergency Statutes Amendment Act, if passed, the bill would give the province sweeping authority to seize control over local emergencies. So today we'll be discussing those three bills and the ramifications of the province municipal relations and also the state of rural municipalities today in 2024. With that, Paul, welcome back to the show. Perfect. Thanks for having me. So, Paul, I want to start off with a sort of general overarching question for the three bills. Bill 18, Bill 20, Bill 21. 
a lot has happened over the last month and a half. Rural municipalities have been sort of uh, taken back from the news uh, releases that I've been seeing. In your own words, what did you think about these three bills when they first were presented? Well, I, I, I'll, I don't even want to be melodramatic. This is a tragedy in three acts. Um, the stark reality of, of, of what's been done is, is that the autonomy, uh, the authority, the, the, the great job that we do on behalf of all Albertans at the most localist levels has, has first of all, not been respected, has been degraded. And, uh, and we're really coming into an era of actually being a, in a bit of an abusive relationship. How, what's an abusive relationship? You isolate, Bill 18. You uh, basically threaten command and control, uh, Bill 20, and you actually assume that you're and, and you're degraded, which is Bill 21. Uh, no, no recognition of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, no understanding, um, and what we have are really uh, three acts that really I will I will say is a direct attack on rural Alberta autonomy. Here's the stark reality, Chris, is that right now population 85% is urban, 15% rural. You know the migration to Alberta. You know what's happening is that we're getting increased urbanization across the world. But let's talk specifically about Alberta, and maybe we can actually speak of the Prairie Provinces. The rural populations are going to be less than the urbans. We're going to see urban governments in the future. And this is really the last chance for us to actually be able to support the autonomy. Uh, because future governments, future elected municipal officials, not only by these three acts, but will ultimately be put into a smaller and smaller box and not be able to do the job that they're doing. And when we have a hyper urban future government, um, rural Albertans and rural elected officials will literally have no say, no voice. And this government has actually achieved that in three acts. And these three acts in many ways are actually uh, at least bill 18 and bill 20 as an attack on Calgary and Edmonton. But the collateral damage is all the rural municipalities in the province of Alberta. Do you so, see it, do you mentioned urban, urban and rural, do you see a differential effect large versus small municipalities or rural versus urban municipalities? Well, I think the, the intent of this is, is to be responsive to straw bylaws and, and to, to maybe put the, the uh, um, put the urban, the, the larger metros on their heels. Um, this has not been thought through and I'll be extremely blunt. I do not believe uh, these three acts were written by uh, um, officials within these departments. I think these were written by constituency associations. They're written by some sort of advisors because they do not understand the unintended consequences. This is a terrible mistake, uh, the way these have been drafted and the way they've been put forward. The rationale is not there. Um, I like Minister McIver. I saw his press conference when I was coming back from Italy. Um, I don't even think he was convinced, to be quite honest. The evidence provided for some of the substance in Bill, uh, Bill 20 is not there. For example, uh, you know, you can't you can't use uh, uh, vouchering for someone or, or vetting someone, uh, voting machines. The, none of this is driven by any single complaint that has occurred from any of the members I've seen. There's no evidence for a majority of these things. This is actually creating bills that in many cases are gesturing on, on what really exists. The one thing I'll tell you is I've been around for a little while. I was elected in 2007. I've never had a prior government restate and overstate that we are children of the province. I've never heard it this much in my entire life than I have in the last two weeks. And you know what? We all knew it. And I've never had a government say it as many times as this government has said it in the last two weeks. Okay. So we are recording this one year since the last provincial election. And during that provincial election, RMA released their uniquely rural campaign that they were asking rural uh, residents from across Alberta to uh, ask their local elected leaders about potential rural issues. One of those was about this bylaw changes and you want it more consultation with the province and you wanted the province to stop making bills in Edmonton and start coming out to your local communities and actually making bylaws that would help or making acts that would help rural communities. Bill 20 seems to be an attack just on that, that part alone. Prior to the introduction of Bill 20 and this part of it, did you have any prior knowledge that this was coming down from the provincial government or were you blindsided like the majority of Alberta was? Listen, I had an amazing trip for three weeks with my wife in Italy. Uh, I was completely off grid. And uh, I said to my wife, hey, what's the worst that could happen while I'm gone? Bill 18 and Bill 20. So I had no indication. 
uh, at a level and scope. Obviously, Bill 18 was talked about because for some reason, this government has Quebec envy. Very confusing. Uh, Bill 18, I'll get specific about Bill 18. Uh, you'll have to create another government department in order to manage uh, the Bill 18 provisions on the relationship. So you'll have to create a sub department because trust me, the volume will be high and the complexity will be there. At the same time, a government that's been hell bent on reducing red tape have created uh, red tape under that provision. Um, and the second part is, is that, that really what we were asking for, for the most part, was to be engaged. This is a conservative government. And my interpretation is con conservative government is small G government, local empowerment. That is literally the textbook example of a, this is not. This is big government, top down, centralization of authority. It's completely different than anything that we saw. It's different than the promises that were made. None of what that's come through these three bills were even discussed in the most at all uh, during campaigning. So fast forward to today, this came from nowhere. Uh, and well, this came from somewhere, but I don't think this came from the ministries, as I said earlier. So this is stuff that's being driven by constituency associations uh, based upon assumptions of conspiracies. Uh, it's pretty disappointing uh, because I don't think these have been thought out. Hey, you got rural Alberta mad. You know how hard it is for a conservative government to get rural Alberta mad? It's almost impossible. And my members, I've given them every opportunity and they said, Paul, you need to speak out. This is a direct attack on what we do, which is not easy and nobody else wants the job. That's why we exist. And I've had members that are blue blooded to you can never imagine. And they said, when do we give them the keys? They think they're so smart they can do the provincial job and our job, then here's the keys. Because that's literally what's being proposed. The other thing I'd say right now is you've actually empowered an unknown future government with a extremely big, big bat. And I've had this conversation with folks. So what we've been told time and time again, this isn't about you guys. We never use it on you. Trust us. Every single meeting with this government, they're going to have a baseball bat in their hand. And they're, and I'm, they're going to say, what's with the baseball bat? Oh, it's not for you. How can I work with a government that's got a baseball bat in their hand every time? When they convince me, they're like, oh, that's not for you at all. This is for someone else. What a ridiculous notion that they can hold that over us. And again, I'm probably going to hear next week that I'm a child of province. Uh, we're their responsibility. They know what's good for us. I'm on my fifth term. You know what? If I went around my municipality and I pretended I knew it was good for everybody, I wouldn't be past one term. If this government thinks they know everything, they don't. They need to be aware that they have Dunning-Kruger up the yin-yang. They don't know. So I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate before I throw it back over to Ian for a second, because um, on my on my show, the Crossboard Interviews, I often ask the question, is there apathy when it comes to municipal issues? You're right. You're right. Your members of RMA are probably upset about these bills. But when you go out to talk to residents of Pinoca County, when you go out and talk to oh, uh, uh, people up in St. Paul County, are you hearing from the app? And I say average resident, like the person who's not tuned into what's going on on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter. And are you actually hearing that these bills are bad or are they just going over their heads and going, it's not my issue, so I'm not going to worry about it? I was in town yesterday, ran into one of the, the good old Bronx that live out here. <laughs> And he said, give them hell. From the, the A&W Senates, from the coffee shops across rural Alberta, they are all talking about this. And they're like, why would you start taking away local government authority? Um, we're winning. And uh, to be quite honest, I'll guarantee you we're winning uh, in the public eye. Um, are we winning with this government? I think they're hell-bent on putting these through for reasons unknown to me, likely uh, some sort of review that's occurring in the fall, maybe, uh, for a certain subset. Uh, but what, what they're not realizing is, is that the folks that I represent, um, they want to have, they respect and trust their local elected officials. Uh, we're government, but we don't act like it. And I think that they're underestimating, uh, quite honestly, um, the respect and the pull that we have. And I think what, when they realize they're going to realize it the hard way. I don't sit there and cry and whine and throw things in the air for no reason at all. I'm telling you right now, this is a terrible mistake, a terrible mistake. And if you've thought this through, you would have come to us first. And when you first showed it to me, I'd say, this is a terrible mistake. And the problem is, is that I'm likely not going to have that voice, but I'm going to continue on the path that I'm on. Yeah. Chris started off with a devil's advocate. I'm going to continue that way. Just a bit. Is there a case to be made for more provincial oversight in local government? Like in particular, in Alberta in particular, is it 
poorly enough behaved or not acting enough in deference of the provincial government? Well, what what Billy what Bill Twenty should have done is first of all, uh, Bill Eighteen could have been addressed by by actually establishing a mechanism for MOUs and a relationship between municipalities approaching the federal government. Undeniably, municipalities have been played by the feds, and we got mom and dad are broken up, and they're not talking, and we got played in the middle. Undeniably, that's occurred. Some folks have bitten into that trap, and that's a mistake. Um, and municipalities have gotten outside their lane. So there's a case to be made for sure that stay in your freaking lane. I'll stay in my lane. You stay in your lane. We need to understand that municipalities that cross into health care or other joint responsibilities of the federal and provincial government should know better. Stay in your lane. And the conversation I have with Mr. McIver is that those provisions under Bill 18 as it relates to bylaws, you should definitely quash bylaws that are not in the lane of municipalities. Undeniable. Has Pinocchio County ever made a bylaw that's outside our lane? Not since the existence of Pinocchio County since 1952. Have they ever left their lane? So what's happened is, is that you've punished everyone by the acts of a few. And the other problem with all these pieces is, especially Bill 20 and Bill 21, these are reassertion of authorities that already exist with the province. And what the province has said, oh, we already have these authorities. This is just providing clarity. It's doing the exact opposite. We do know you've got the ability to do this. You've showed it that you have the possibility. You've rescinded the, the mask bylaw in Edmonton. You've showed you have the authority at cabinet. You shouldn't make it easy. It should still be hard and municipalities should know better. The problem is, is that quite honestly, 90% of the municipalities will never leave their lane ever. We know what our job is. We know what we need to do and creating policy to punish very rare acts that definitely probably should be addressed uh, and dragging the rest of us down. As I said, it's an existential crisis for municipal authority because ultimately what you've done is you used a massive hammer and destroyed, quite honestly, the autonomy and the ability of, of municipalities to do the job they do. If I have the government looming over me that I'm offside and them threatening me, it does not take very long for you to realize that probably a municipal affair uh, minister in the past or in the future could use this horrifically, horrifically. This is a monster of the future that we don't know, and it may be a monster in the past that we may know. But that's who could use this poorly, and this could destroy the relationship of municipalities. It could destroy rural Alberta, and it could really, actually, I'll be honest, it's how a provincial government could fall if misused. Across the country, well, because of the constitutional nature of local government in this country, uh, there's a slight differences from province to province and how local governments are structured. Are you hearing anything from colleagues across the country about what's going on in, with these, well, the, at least the impact, potential impact of these three bills, and kind of what would that response be from elsewhere? Well, I'm hearing them from everybody. They're thinking, geez, if, if Alberta can do this, Saskatchewan, we should do that too. That's not a bad idea. And New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And I don't know who's Ontario. I mean, I mean, what they could say is, wait a minute, you know, we can have a little bit more control. Kind of looks good. Um, so the problem with this is that the, the ability to weaponize this is quite significant. And I think that you must realize that MLAs uh, likely would get lots of phone calls if, if a group in an area didn't like something and said, you know what, this council is offside, we need to get rid of this council. Um, that's going to happen. I will tell you right now that will happen. You will get outcries of groups, and it may not actually be the community as a whole, but individuals. So that's what I think a lot of municipal leaders across Canada are really worried about, is that this becomes such a significant weapon held by the province that's not going to follow due process as it normally would. And they're very concerned about it. Bill 18 is is definitely i'm going to expect quite a few quite a few jurisdictions are going to pick up bill 18 because they're like well wait a minute that's not a bad idea you know quebec's doing it we can have control we can make sure we get all the glory because that's what everybody wants and uh i wouldn't be surprised if those two definitely move through and some of the pieces tied to, to bill 20 might get adopted by other provinces so my colleagues across canada uh are worried and they probably should be worried because this really bad idea uh could catch on in a lot of other places Last fall at the RMA convention in Edmonton, Premier Smith got up on the stage and said that uh, this government and RMA are in a strong relationship because they support each other. Um, I'm going to ask a stupid question, but I think it's an important one to end on. How is your relationship with this government today, May 17th, as of recording? Well, I think our, our relationship is as good as they want it to be. Um, I, I don't believe that I actually own 
any of the issues. I'm having to respond to um, the unintended consequences of probably three bills that have not been properly thought out. And regretfully, um, I think that going forward, the problem we're going to have is, is that I, I expect that cabinet thought that consultation occurred on all three of these bills. That's my expectation, that they felt that we followed a process that we are typically committed to on these joint uh, matters of interest between both, both parties. And so the Smith government and, and all the ministries need to probably do some, and we're looking and say, wait a minute, what is your test? Did we actually, it doesn't mean we need to agree. You don't need to make it, make me happy at every time. I don't even ask for that. But I'll tell you right now, if something's a mistake and I'm telling you it's a mistake, um, my members are saying this is a mistake. I'm taking hundreds of years of corporate knowledge telling you I've been around for a long time. I've seen many, many premiers. If I'm telling you this is a bad idea, you should probably pay attention because I don't often say that's a bad idea. Very rarely do I use my pulpit to say this is a bad idea. And I'm telling you right now, this is a bad idea. Paul, I want to thank you from both Ian and myself for joining us today again on the Political Trenches. It's always a pleasure to sit down and chat with you. You betcha. Have an amazing long weekend. You too. Our full interview with Paul will be airing next Wednesday. We'll be right back after a quick message. Ian, I feel like I've actually truly been out of the political trenches after that interview with Paul McLaughlin. It seems like he he's fired up and he's ready for a little bit of war here with the provincial government on Bill 18, 20, and 21. How'd you think the episode went? Yeah, you're probably quite right that this I haven't seen local government people in Alberta this exercised, if you like, about something the province has done ever. The person we spoke to, of course, is a representative of the rural municipalities in the province. We also have an urban municipal association. My suspicion is that they are pretty much hand in glove in terms of what they think about these two bills. So they, the government has really kicked a hornet's nest here. Paul ended up a little bit talking about the potential of this cascading across the country. And certainly there would be concern there within certain provinces for sure. So I would be very surprised if this goes away quietly. So more information on Bill 18, 20, and 21 are in the show notes. So the links to the actual responses that RMA has given out on each of these bills will be in the show notes, but also the link to the Alberta government's actual uh, press conferences and news releases about these bills will be in the show notes as well. But until next time, Ian, what do you have on the agenda for the next two weeks? Because we're almost in June now. <laughs> Well, the big thing for this week is I submitted the manuscript of my uncivil behavior book on abuse. Of oh, it's titled <laughs> now. <laughs> uncivil Society, it's called. And it's with the un in brackets. So it's gone off to Municipal World for editing. So it's off my plate for a little while, at least. So that's, there's that. Oh, we've, we've got conferences coming up. I've got some speaking engagement. You made reference to, uh, or Paul made reference to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, or FCM conference. There's the Canadian Municipal Administrators Association Conference, or CAMA, coming up too. And then a few others, the Local Government Administrators of Alberta is coming up in the next few weeks as well. So it's heavy into conference season for sure. Lots going on. And I just found out this, by the time this airs, this conference will be just ending up. But in Calgary, the long weekend starting on the 19th of May, the International Municipal Clerks Conference is actually taking place as well, which I did not know was ex existed. And I'm trying to get, hopefully, by the time we take, speak next, I will have some details on how that went. Uh, until then, we will be at, well, I will be at FCM. So those who are, do, or who are going, please say hi to me if you're there. Ian, in and I will hopefully be able to do a live show there and hopefully speak to someone from FCM about Canada on our municipal road trip. So until two weeks from now, have yourself an excellent day. And Ian, always a pleasure. You too. We'll see you later then, Chris. Thanks.